Uh, hello, my name is Brian Lowry. I'm a columnist and critic with Variety. Uh, as part of Media Literacy Week, we are having this conversation here with uh, about media literacy and uh, are joined by what are uh, we, would, we would refer to as thought leaders on the topic. Uh, to my left is uh, Leba Geft, who is the director of the Museum of Tolerance. Uh, Mark Slavkin, the director of education at the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts and Tessa Joles, who is the president of the Center for Media Literacy. As you talked about the technology, if it isn't almost like a medical ethics issue, which is that you develop the procedure and we can go mess around with the DNA and change these things, and then talk afterwards about the ethics of actually doing that. And in, this, in the same sort of way, the devices come first. The iPad comes and the phone comes and all of these things that can immerse us in media come but we don't have the conversation about the effects of the media until after the devices are, are in everybody's home. Yeah, this idea of digital citizenship is another phrase that I heard um, the other night. It's like we've immersed all of us in this brand new world, but the roadmap, the, the rules of the road, the basic ethical uh, issues and practices, um, I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface of that. And young people are more immersed, this thing the other day, that nine hours a day teenagers may engage with a screen, the phone, or the iPad, or their laptop, um, which is remarkable. It's like we set them forth in this new universe without really thinking through, not even basic protection issues and privacy issues, but those ethical issues about bullying online, about dispensing falsehoods about anybody, about plagiarism, about all of that. Um, I don't know that kids are getting 10 minutes of that before the teacher sends them home to go online. Well, and, the, and that's one of the big issues is that our education system still is really focused on content rather than on process skills. And so what is scarce is the adult guidance. What is scarce is the adult discussion with young people about ethics and about all of the context surrounding the knowledge and in, in the content information. And so a big job of ours is to figure out how can we help train teachers in a methodology that will help them guide their students and help the students learn to navigate this big world of information out there. And there are methods out there uh, certainly media literacy is a discipline that's been emerging for the last 50 years. It's just that it hasn't taken hold in the education system. Uh, and it hasn't taken hold in the education system because it is a new paradigm for education. But it's precisely because schools and frankly most, most companies and organizations must confront the fact that we actually have to find a new value proposition. We are no longer valuable for the kinds of things that we used to do before. As you pointed out, the teacher is not expected to be the font of knowledge because they'll look it up faster than any teacher can teach it. And once we've acknowledged that when we start to formulate a new value proposition, my hope is um, that it will be based on all of the important questions that you've kept reiterating. And it's not about facts and answers. It's all about being able to ask the right questions. And that's what leads to critical thinking and analysis and reflection and the absolutely vital tools to thrive and to survive in, in a very fast-paced and rapidly changing world. Is there, is there a role beyond, we talked a little about the education system and trying to get this into education. What about, uh, or what, is, what are the uh, responsibilities and what, what outreach possibilities are there? to both the producers of content and the uh, distributors of the technology, which is, in other words, does media literacy now have to include Apple and Microsoft in the conversation, as well as uh, Paramount and Disney? We would hope so, because there are some natural opportunities. I mean, if media is really the biggest educator in the world, well then certainly we should be using media to teach media literacy. But that hasn't been the case. Um, 
so often it's it really is left to the education system to do that type of education. And as as Lima mentioned earlier, the value proposition for the education system needs to change. Uh, and there needs to be that recognition of the need for the process skills. Uh, so we're in kind of a catch-22 here because on the one hand, our children are learning an incredible amount from media, but they don't have the skills of discernment and, and it's not easy to obtain the skills of discernment with the resources that they have. And I think you're talking about the ethics of globalization. Together, and every single step along the way bears some responsibility. Um, it come, it becomes legal issues, it becomes ethical issues, it becomes constitutional issues. Uh, to give you an example, in the recent past, the incidents of incitement via social media, very deliberate, inflammatory, dangerous incitement, much of it coming out of, of the Middle East and, and related to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, um, has caused a great deal of alarm. And the Simon Wiesenthal Center has prevailed upon Facebook to disallow thousands of these kinds of posts. But they're having a much harder time talking to the executives at Twitter who feel that they should not interfere at all with what is posted. And what are the limits of, of free speech? What should be allowed and what, what should not? Um, and this is part of the debate that goes on in the Museum of Tolerance as well. And ultimately, it, it's not about shutting down speech, but offering more speech and amplifying those voices of hope and positivity and, and, and constructive contributions to the conversation. At the end of the day, it's my responsibility how I'm going to use it. And if I don't have the skills, and I have no idea how to approach it, and I'm not even aware of the pitfalls and the dangers that are there, I will not be successful in that uh, pursuit and, and will not be responsible for myself and, and others. Yeah, the, the globalization I think is a great point and uh, the responsibility of what is true. There are a lot of young people, including some in my family, who their primary news um, source is The Daily Show with John mm -hmm. Stewart and now Trevor Noah, I think. Um, and they get a lot of the humor and they get a lot of the satire, but I don't know how they're able to draw lines in their own mind about what was truly satirical and completely made up and what was very real and based on something that happened in the news that day. And I think those shows do a good job kind of weaving in and out. But we're reliant on some very powerful media channels, let's say, um, who have enormous influence over young people. And where, where's the ethical guidance of that? Um, and I'm not sure it's about censorship. I do think it comes back to the critical thinking skills and the, the analysis skills. Um, I was mentioning earlier that in our the play Wiesenthal that's showing now, we're having lots of middle and high school students see the show, which I'm very proud of. And in the Q&A after the show the other day, one of the younger students, who's probably 12, said to Tom Dugan, who wrote the play and performs it, is everything you said in this play, which is about the story of individual Nazi leaders and how Wiesenthal helped bring them to justice, students said, is that true? Um, and I'm glad that he raised it, mm -hmm. and I think others might have been thinking it in their room, but it sort of begs that question, is how do they, at those younger ages, make meaning or clarity about what's true and what's not true, if it all seems kind of real in the way that it comes to them, whether it's on TV or film or video or in a, in a, in a, in a theater. Um, what is true, and how would you give that young person the skills to start to figure that out by himself? Um, we discussed this uh, a little bit before, but about uh, whether this discussion ends up sort of being eat your broccoli for for you know audiences. Um, is there a way to incorporate these messages into material? The museum probably has more license to do it than I would think uh, theatrical productions necessarily, but to convey these messages in a way that won't feel like people are being lectured to, preached to, etc. I think it can be very liberating because we're encouraging people to ask questions, to, to challenge their beliefs or what they hear, um, and to take responsibility for the information and the way that they process it. And yes, certainly in a museum setting that can be part and parcel of the journey of discovery. 
certainly in this museum that takes place. But I think that the arts are a powerful stimuli for raising questions, um, for raising all kinds of issues, for stimulating discussion and uh, reflection. Um, we should all be growing up to ask questions. And I know you have these very succinct rubrics, mm -hmm. um, specific tools, and how to use them, those roadmaps that at least set us on the right path and give us a more solid footing as we embark on this journey. Um, all I'm saying is that it's, it's going to be a tremendous ride through this technology revolution. Let us at least be prepared. Well, I think Leva really hits the mark here because what we want to encourage is skepticism and this asking questions, having a process of inquiry. And there's the idea of uh, coming from behavioral economics about heuristics. And when it comes down to it, media literacy is a heuristic. It's a shortcut for critical analysis. And it's based on a set of very simple concepts and questions. And so we want to look at how do media operate as a system globally. And so there are some questions that we emphasize. Uh, one of them is, who created this message? Another one is, what techniques are used to attract my attention? Another one is, how might other people understand this message differently? Uh, fourth one is, what lifestyles, values, and points of view are represented in or omitted from this message? And then the last one is, why was this message sent? And so those are questions for consumers of media. And then we have concurrent questions for producers of media that relate to the same basic concepts. And so with a simple rubric like that, um, you can really help young people sort through media messages pretty quickly. And as they practice asking these questions and applying these questions to different situations, then they learn to really ask them more quickly and, and have a, a very quick process for critical analysis. Now, I agree with you, Mark, that um, you know, it does take time. And certainly when, when young people are first learning to apply a process of inquiry, it takes more time to teach them. But you know, the goal is to really make it an automatic process, something that they've internalized so that they can take it with them no matter where they go and no matter which media they're using.